Now remember, what is type 1 again? What's type 1? It means they're in front of you. That, what's the probability of making a type 1 error? Alpha. And what is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you reject it when it's actually true, yeah. You reject the null hypothesis when it's really true. And a type 2 error is when you fail to reject the null hypothesis when it's really false. Okay? So I just want to bring up a couple more points about type, uh, type 1 and type 2 errors. So alpha is the probability you see up here. It's the probability of rejecting the null when it is true. That is called a conditional probability. Okay? Now, very often, people think that the reverse of a conditional probability is the same thing, but it's not. It's not. And so I want to talk about particular concepts with alpha that may be a little confusing. Okay? When we talk about alpha is defined as the probability, that's one thing, but sometimes people find it easier to think of it as a percentage, not, in, not 0.05, but actually 5%. If we say 5%, 5% of what? Okay, what do we mean when we say 5%? All right? Now, it's really typical if you ask people, you know, well, 5% of what? They'll say, well, 5% of all studies that are done are type 1 errors. No, 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 no. That's not true. Okay? As he says here, what he's saying is alpha can be defined as the percentage of null or ineffective experiments that still attain significance. I want to draw your attention to his wording there. He refers to null or ineffective, ineffective experiments. Those are experiments where the null is true. They're experiments where the null is true. There is no effect. There is no effect. Problem is, we never know which ones those are, right? That's always the problem. So alpha is the percentage or the probability of ineffective experiments that still achieve significance. Okay? There really is no effect, but they nevertheless attain significance. That's what alpha is. And it's a specific difference here. Right? It's very common. Um, like here's an example. It's on the next page. Let's say we're only going to take a couple minutes with this. Uh, on the next page, right? If I told you somebody, a researcher, did 100 significance tests, right? 100 significance tests, 100 null hypotheses, okay? And alpha is set to 0.05. How many type 1 errors do you think he made? Okay, that's the question. Somebody does 100 experiments, 100 significance tests, how many type 1 errors do you think he made? Yeah. Good. Okay. We don't have enough information because we don't know of those 100 experiments how many are ineffective or null. So we don't know. So think of it this way, right? If I have 100 experiments, if all of them are ineffective, if all of them are null, then what's the highest number that could be um, type 1 errors? The highest number of type 1 errors that we have? Yeah, five, right? If they're all ineffective, what we're saying is only five will get through, okay? If those 100 experiments, they are all effective, that is, the null hypothesis is false, then how many type 1 errors can I make? All 100 are actually a false null hypothesis. How many type 1 errors can I make? Let's see. None. Zero. Zero. Okay? Now, the truth is, of those 100 tests, some of them might be ineffective. Some of them might. We don't know. That's the problem. We don't know. In any given group of tests, we don't know how many are ineffective and how many are effective. So you can't tell. Okay? So you have to be careful. When you read the questions, be very careful what they're asking. What I asked was just, if someone does 100 significance tests, I didn't tell you if I knew whether they were ineffective or effective. I didn't know. Okay? But I could phrase the question like, somebody does 100, 100 significance tests where the null is true. That's a different kind of question. Okay? 
The whole purpose of null hypothesis testing is to keep, the null, keep null experiments from being viewed as effective. He has a really nice analogy in, the, um, in that part of the chapter, uh, talking about a spam filter. Okay? We all have email at this point, right? We're all, when we do email, what happens? We have spam folders, we have inboxes. Hmm? If the spam filter is set to a certain amount, so most of the spam winds up in your spam folder, but some of it gets into the inbox, right? That's analogous to a type 1 error. Now, let's say I made my spam filter so tight that no spam would get into my inbox. What's likely to happen? You know this because it's happened to you. Yeah. Right, right. Your good messages will wind up in your spam folder and they get lost. Okay? So the question is, if you, if you view the alpha level as a spam filter, it's like, how high do you set it to get what? All right? Now, he has a theorem in there called Bayes' theorem that can help you actually calculate it. So he talks about the spam filter and he walks you through Bayes' theorem. You're not going to be held responsible for that. I'm not going to ask you on a test to calculate Bayes' theorem. We're not going to go over it. But it's a really nice analogy. And if you just walk through it once, it's kind of helpful to see what he means about these things. Okay? This is what he's saying. Come to believe that 5% of all tests result in type 1 errors. That's not right. That's not right. Okay? And this is what I was just telling you, right? In reality, there's no way to estimate the percentage of experiments that are ineffective, and it doesn't depend on alpha. Alpha is not the determinant of that. Okay? So I mentioned that alpha is a conditional probability. So there's this common tendency to believe that the reverse probability is the same as also alpha. That's not true. And like I said, if you look through that, that uh, spam filter analogy, you'll see that it's not. Okay, Don't get too hung up on it, but I want you to understand the basic bullet points of what I'm talking about here. Okay, One of the problems is that what's likely to be published? The significant results. We don't see the non-significant results. So that's always a problem um, in terms of knowing how many are ineffective experiments, how many are effective experiments, right? If somebody, if somebody published all the data, you know, all the experiments that everybody's ever done, then we'd know which experiments were null and which ones were not. But we don't know that. Okay? So as I mentioned, so there's the, the Bayes theorem which you can thank me, you don't have to calculate. Um, but this is the basic idea. Your total number of significant results are made up, they come up from two pools, right? The ineffective experiments and the effective experiments. So that's why, so we use alpha, right? we use that alpha to kind of steer the ineffective experiments to the spam box and keep the good ones. But there's always, there's always little errors, there's little things, right? There's bad mail that gets into your inbox, and there's good mail that winds up in your spam folder. It's not 100%. Okay? So that's it for Chapter 5. Anybody have questions on that? More questions on that? <coughs> yeah, go ahead. I'd have to see the problem. In theory, I haven't assigned you anything that you can't do, but uh, I'd have to take a look at it because I just don't remember offhand. Okay, you can show me afterwards if you want. Okay? All right, folks. So we did Chapter 5, right? Chapter 5 was the simplest scenario. That is a one-sample test, right? You were comparing one sample to a population. And we had all the information, right? We had population means. We had standard deviations. Right? Well, things are going to change. Things are going to change. The basic setup that we've looked at is going to stay the same, but the information that we have, the number of groups, all that stuff is going to change. Okay? So we're still looking at one group now, but let's see how it's different. So this example, based on previous research, a college instructor believes that the average student spends approximately 12 hours a week outside of class engaged in studying. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if, uh, if you guys are thinking that's crazy or if the pre-meds among you think that that's too low. Um, but so to find out whether this is true for her students, the students at her university, okay, the students at her university, 
She asks a random sample of 25 students to estimate the number of hours they study during a typical week. Okay? So her students say they study 10 hours a week. Okay? Maybe this wasn't anonymous and they had to make her feel better. I don't know. All right? And that standard deviation, where is that standard deviation from? What is that? I say S equals 3. It's 3 hours. But what standard deviation is that? Is it, is it sigma? Is it a population standard deviation? So where is it from? Her sample. Her sample. Okay. So now we've entered the realm where we don't have sigma anymore. Now the good news is that we're going to be able to estimate sigma. Right? We're going to estimate sigma using S. So I'm using my sample standard deviation to estimate my population standard deviation. That's not a problem. Let's see what happens. Okay. So this is what you know so far. It's a regular one sample z test. We have mu, we have sigma, we get the standard error using the population standard deviation. We've done that so far. What happens if you don't have it? Well, there's two scenarios. Okay. If n is large, okay, let me stress, if n is large, meaning what here? A hundred. A hundred. Okay. Then you could do this. You could just estimate, remember what we had? We had the standard error using sigma equals this. Right? Sigma divided by the square root of n. Yeah? Okay? Now, if we have s, we can do it the same way. We actually have it. This, the formula is the same. So that's nice. That makes our life easier. Okay? If I only have s, and if my sample size is 100 or more, I can do this. Big if, by the way. Big if, by the way. Okay? If I don't, if it's smaller, then I have a problem. Okay? Now, this is the problem. I'm using s to estimate sigma, right? If my sample size is small, there's a lot of error associated with that estimate. Okay? If, if my sample size is big, then I'm getting close to the population, s is a pretty good estimate of sigma. If my sample is very small, not very small, but small, then s is not necessarily such a good estimate. There is error involved. Okay, if there's error involved, then we have a bit of a problem. Now, this is what it comes down to. This, if I take my variable, let's say it's a normally distributed variable or whatever, but I'm getting my means anyway, and I convert it, right? This gave me a normal distribution, right? Z was normal. It was normally distributed, and I could use it. I could find all my probabilities. That was fine. Now, why could I do that? Because this is actually a linear transformation. Remember what I said about linear transformations? Adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing by a constant. Here I'm subtracting a constant. Here I'm dividing by a constant. Sigma is a constant. One population standard deviation. It doesn't change. But now jump down to here for a minute. Okay? If I'm still subtracting a constant, but here I'm dividing by, that's not a constant anymore. Because s is not a constant. s is a variable. Why is s now a variable? Because every time you take a different sample, you will get a different number. Right? That makes sense, eh? If I know the population, so it's only one number. But if I'm taking samples trying to estimate the population, then it's not one number anymore. Then it varies. And that's a variable. Okay? So this ratio is not normal anymore. It's not a normal distribution. It's not a normal distribution. So we have to have another distribution that we can go to to find our probabilities. Okay? The distribution that we go to was developed by a man named William Gossett who worked for the Guinness Brewery Company. Yes, statisticians can have cool jobs. Okay? Actually, one of my graduate students was in London, and she went to the Guinness Brewery, and she saw that they had a plaque 
for him and she took a picture and sent it to me. You know, it's very bizarre. <laughs> um, this is what statisticians do in their free time. Okay. Uh, so anyway, William Guinness, uh, William, William Gossett, was working for the Guinness Brewery Company, and he developed the table that corrected this error, <coughs> that corrected the possibility that there was error because you're using S instead of sigma. Now, he published under the name student. So the distribution he developed is called student's T distribution, or people just refer to it as the T distribution. Now, why did he publish under the name student? Because Guinness didn't want their competition to find out that he had figured this problem out. That's why. And this was back in like 1908 or something. Now, the distribution that he found, this T distribution, is similar to a normal distribution. It's still bell-shaped. It's still asymptotic. But it has a mean of 0. But it's flatter than a normal distribution. Okay, But the shape of this distribution depends on sample size. It's really a family of distributions depending on sample size. So for example, if this is a normal distribution, a normal distribution looks something like that. A T distribution might look something like this. It's flatter. As you increase the sample size, as your sample size gets bigger, the shape of that distribution will start to look normal. Which is why, when you hit about 100, you can go back to using Z. Because it gets normal as your sample size increases. Most of us are using smaller sample sizes, but this is, um, so we're using the T distribution, but that's what happens. Okay? Questions, questions on that so far? That should be, that's okay. You're reserving your questions until you figure out what the question should be? Okay. So let us actually figure this out for this example, okay? First of all, let's take a look at our hypotheses. Our hypotheses. Is this a directional test or a non-directional test? Look at the words on that first page for that example. Is that a directional hypothesis or a non-directional hypothesis? Helpful if you look at those words and try to figure it out. Non directional or directional? Yeah. What's the difference? What's the difference between a non directional and a directional hypothesis? Anybody remember? Yeah. Well, yeah, one is one tailed, one is two tailed, but it also has to do with the direction, right? <coughs> now, is she saying, um, I'm wondering if the students at my university um, are slackers or they study less than everybody else. Is she saying that? No, what is she saying? She's wondering whether they're different. That's a non-directional test because you're looking in both directions. You're not assuming one or the other. All right. How do I set up the null hypothesis here? What is it? What I want to know is whether the students at her school are the same as the national average. So what's my null hypothesis here? <coughs> yeah? Can we be more specific in symbols? Anyone want to help her out? Yeah. <coughs> no, but thank you for making that mistake. He said X bar. Do I ever want to see X bar in any hypothesis? No, right? Because it's always about the population. The population. Para they're about parameters, right? Hypotheses are always about parameters. I never, ever want to see X bar in a hypothesis. But you're on the right track. Someone else had their hands up. Yeah. Yeah, mu equals 12. What is mu representing here? The population mean at her school. You're saying that that's the same as the other, as the rest of the country, okay? And our null then is, of course, you do know this, yes? Yes. Thank you.
right? We're trying to reject the null in favor of the alternative. OK, yeah? Non-directional. Yeah, non-directional. You know, a better name for it might be bi-directional, but they don't say that. OK? All right, so let's assume an alpha equal to 0.05. That's the risk that we're willing to take. And let us calculate this t. Now again, this t, because it's calculated, some people refer to it as t calc, t observed, t obtained. That's to keep it straight from the t critical values that you get from the table. OK? So what is it? It's x bar minus mu divided by the standard error. OK, what am I missing here? What do I not have? The standard error, yeah. So my standard deviation was 3. N was what? Yeah, 25. So my standard error is 0.6. Right? This isn't even anything that we haven't done so far. That's my t value, just like a z. All you're doing, again, remember what you're doing. You're taking a mean and you're transforming it into this t value. Why? Because you know the probabilities for the t. And then you're going to make a decision. OK, so now we have to make the decision. So what am I going to do? Well, what did I do when I was doing z? What did I compare it to? How did I make a determination using z when I did z, when I did a, a one sample z test? One thing, well, one thing was to transform z into um, alpha into a z too. What did I get? What did I get from the table? What were they called? Yeah. Critical yeah, critical values, z critical values. So now what, what do I have to get? t critical values, t critical values. OK, let's take a look at a t-table and see how it's different. OK. Now, notice something. So on the top, this is going to differ from a z-table in a couple of ways. First of all, look on the top. Levels of significance for a one-tailed test, levels of significance for a two-tailed test. Those are the only areas under the curve you're going to see. The body of the table is critical values or values that correspond to these probabilities. Remember, in a z-table, we had each z-score had two probabilities next to it. You don't have that anymore. And you're never going to have that again. It's particular to a z-table. Now, there's too many other options. So we only have these probabilities and then the corresponding critical values. OK, so that's across the top. And again, whether it's one-tailed or two-tailed. All right. Now, going down the side, we have degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom. In order to look this up, we're going to have to use the right number of degrees of freedom to find a critical value. So let's take a look at something. As my degrees of freedom go up, and let's look at the 0.05 values. As the degrees of freedom go up, what happens to the critical values? They get smaller. They get smaller. Here's another case where n is affecting our, in our outcome. As n is increasing, or degrees of freedom are increasing, those critical values are getting smaller, which means what? They're coming closer to the middle, which means it'll be easier to reject. Okay. Now, let's take a look at something else. Look at, like, I don't know, five degrees of freedom. Look at what happens to your critical values as alpha gets smaller. So that's looking across the table. What happens as your alpha gets smaller? They get bigger. They get bigger, right? That's because as alpha is getting smaller, as the area under the curve is getting smaller, they're becoming more extreme. Those z values are becoming, or those t values are becoming more extreme. Okay? So in this case, we have one sample. What are the degrees of freedom for one sample? n minus 1. n minus 1. So we have an alpha of 0.05, two-tailed. This case was two-tailed, right? And how many degrees of freedom do I have for this example? 24. Let's go down to 24 degrees of freedom. So my, my t critical values 
It's plus or minus 2.064. The plus and minus is actually more appropriate. Let's draw a picture. Okay? So what we have here Right? How much area is in those tails? How much area is in those tails? Hmm? Yeah, good. 0.025 in each tail. 0.025 in each tail. Okay? So those are my critical values, right? Outside of here, we reject. And on this side as well. So what is my t? What t did I get? What was my t observed? It's like up there, folks. These are not rhetorical questions. It'll keep you more awake if you're actually engaged. What is that? What's my t observed? Yeah, it's this, right? It's this. Where does that fall on this graph? Oh, maybe here? Okay. So now, so here's questions to ask you, right? Do I reject or do I fail to reject? The null hypothesis, right? I'm rejecting this, which means what? Is it significant or is it not significant? It's significant. What does that mean for this? For this study, what does it mean in words? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, her class is different. Her kids are slackers. All right, they're different. Okay, maybe 10 hours is not slacking, but you get the idea. Right, they're different. They're significantly different. Okay, here's another question for that. What is the probability of getting a mean of 10 hours taking a sample of 25 kids based on this data. What's the probability of it? You can't give me an exact value, but you can give me a relative value. What's the probability of it happening? Look at the picture. What's the probability of it happening? Sure. What is the probability of getting a mean of 10 hours and a standard deviation of three hours, if you want to be specific, if you've taken a sample of 25 students. So you can't give me an exact number. You don't have an exact number. Yeah. <coughs> less than, yeah, less than 0 0.025, but how do we really write it? We really write it like this. The probability is less than 0.05 two-tailed. When you say that, everybody knows it's cut in half. It's just the way people write it. Thanks. OK. Are you all understanding where that's coming from? Do you have questions? Yeah. Well, it's less than alpha. It's less than alpha, right? It wasn't actually exactly alpha. It's less than alpha. Other questions? Yeah. What do you mean to prove alpha? You mean the, the hypothesis? Yeah. The null hypothesis? So we use alpha, and I'm sorry, what were you? The critical values. Right, so we use the critical values. They correspond to alpha, right? It's just the, it's the axis values that correspond to alpha. Okay? The probability of that value? Yeah. OK. OK. What I said was, what is the probability of getting a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3? Right? That's the data from this example. OK? So I transformed it into a t. So I know that it's down here somewhere. OK. What's the area under the curve over here? Yeah. So it has to be less than 0.025, right? OK. So is that why you don't write less than 0.025? You write It's just, it's like, it's um, tradition. It's like convention that people write things this way. Okay. That's all. Yeah. So it's the critical value. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. On each side, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you, if you won't ask for it, if we could get an objection. Um, oh, so, well, the thing is, this is how you do it with a table, right? <coughs> if you were doing this in SPSS, you wouldn't do it this way. Because what does SPSS give you? SPSS will give you a T value and what they call, there's a column called SIG. Okay? First of all, you should know SPSS doesn't do Zs. It'll never do a Z test. It'll always do a, D, a T test by default. Okay? But the print edit will give you, it'll give you a T, right? So let's say it gives you a T value of minus 3.33. It'll give you, under the SIG column, it'll actually give you an exact probability. Now, I'm going to make this up, okay? I don't know what it is. I'm just making this up. All right? I have to like say that 10 times because people come back to me and say, where did you get those numbers from? I made this up. I made this up, okay? So how would you compare this? What is this? That's your P level. That's your P level. So when you're doing SPSS, you have to compare this to what? What would you compare that to? Yeah, alpha. alpha. You would compare this to alpha. But when you're doing this stuff by hand, you're comparing your T observed to your T critical value. Okay? Yeah? They made it up. Okay. All right? Can we move on from this? Okay. Now, so we're going to talk a little bit more about this, and then we're going to talk about something else. But let's talk about how N and what goes into it, right? Under, I hope you're understanding at this point of the semester how important <laughs> sample size is in all of this, OK? As, you, as the N goes up, what happens? Well, first of all, as N goes up, what happens to your standard error? You should know this in your sleep at this point. As N increases, what happens to your standard error? It decreases. So what's going to happen to T? increases, increases, and then your probability will decrease, right? So as t increases, that increases the chance that you're going to reject, okay? But now n is in another place. Where is n showing up? In your degrees of freedom. As n gets bigger, what happens to your degrees of freedom? They also get bigger. What happens to your t-critical value? We said it before. They get smaller. They get smaller. So n is having a double effect here. It's making your t observed bigger and your critical value smaller. OK? All right. So cautions when using the one sample test, right? Big problem. You should be meeting your assumptions. We've always talked about the assumptions. These are typical assumptions we've talked about, independent random sampling, normal distributions, Standard deviation of the sample equals that of the comparison population. We don't always know what that is. It's an assumption that we're meeting. Some of these assumptions we can actually test out. Some of them we can't. Okay? Uh, it's easy for sampling biases to creep in. When you're doing just one group, it's really easy to get a sampling bias. So you have to be careful. That's one of the problems with a one sample test. And worse with small samples. And we still have the same problem we've had all along. There's no control group. There's no control group. So it's really, it's really hard to tell conclusions. We usually don't do one sample tests. I teach this step to you guys because it's the baby steps to get to the more complicated stuff, but it's very rare that you would do this. OK. Now we're going to start asking different, a different question. Okay. What if, instead of just wanting to do a hypothesis test, I actually wanted to estimate a population mean, OK? Now, there's two ways to estimate a population mean, right? One way is what we call a point estimate. That's when I look at you and I say, I think your weight is 150 pounds. That is a point estimate, one value, OK? The point estimate for a group usually is its mean. It can be other things, but we're going to be dealing with means. But there's another way 
<coughs> that I can estimate your weight. I can look at you and say, I think your weight falls between 140 and 160 pounds, right? That's a range of values where I think your weight falls. That's called an interval. More than that, right, so, I get, so that's called an interval estimate. More than that, in an interval estimate, I can also specify how sure I am about that interval. Okay? So here's an example. Let's say you call up mom and you say, well, I am 80% sure that I got a grade between 80 and 90. She's like, okay. You say, but like, I'm 99% sure that I got a grade between 60 and 100. Okay? Now, what did I do there? First of all, I specified how sure I was. That's a probability. That's a probability. And in the context that we're going to be using, it's called a confidence level, how confident I am. But it's a probability. OK? What happens when I got more confidence? What happens to the size of the interval? I made it bigger, right? Now, a confidence interval, and that's what these are called, these interval estimates are called confidence intervals. A confidence interval gives you an estimate of where the population mean is going to fall, but it also tells you something about precision of that estimate, accuracy, right? If I told you I thought my grade was between 85 and 90, that's a small interval. It's a pretty precise estimate. It's a good estimate, right? But if I tell you my grade is between 50 and 100, is that a good estimate? That's a lousy estimate. There's a lot of error associated with it. So that's the other thing that we're going to get from confidence intervals, is how good an estimate do we think this is? How precise is it? And that'll be based on the width of our interval. Okay? So our general procedure, our general procedure goes something like this. And this is true for the confidence intervals we're going to do for one group, but it's going to be true for other confidence intervals as well. We start out with some point estimate. In this chapter, it's a mean. It could be something else, but it's a mean here. We start out with a point estimate, and we add and subtract a certain amount to get that range of values. What is the amount that we subtract and add? Well, it's going to be a standard error type thing times some kind of critical value. The critical value will give us our level of confidence, right? And the standard error will give us our amount of uncertainty. That's going to create our confidence interval. Okay. Now, so how much distance above and below? It depends on the level of confidence. <coughs> By convention, we often use 95 or 99% confidence. 95 or 99% confidence. What's that analogous to? Yeah, alpha. Yeah. What we're going to see is that confidence intervals are essentially the flip side of a hypothesis test. That's really what they are. They're the flip side of a hypothesis test. Okay. All things being equal, if you are more confident, you have a larger interval, a wider interval. And again, you see how this is arbitrary. Could you create a 94% confidence interval? Of course. Or a 93 or a 97? Yeah. But conventionally, we do 95 and 99. Okay. Now, here the second thing is you're making probability statements about the interval, not the mean. Let me give you an example here. Okay? Let's say, let's say I'm trying to estimate the number of miles to Boston. Let's say I know that it's 250 miles. Okay? For those of you who are actually from Boston, I'm sorry. I don't know what it is. Let's say it's 250 miles. Now, if I gave you all a piece of paper and on your own you estimated an interval that you thought captured the number of miles to Boston. So some of you might say 220 to 300. Some of you might say, I don't know, 100 to 150, right? I get lots and lots of estimates. Some would include the actual number, right? And then some of them would not. Some of them would be too high. Some of them would be too low, right? If I did that over and over and over and over again, different samples, different estimates, 95% of those would actually contain the, the value, the population value. 
5% of them would be. Those 5% are analogous to type 1 errors. Now, when I say that I'm making probability statements about the interval, not the mean, in this case, again, assume that it's 250 miles to Boston, okay? That's a fixed value. That's a fixed value. My confidence, my probability statements are not about this fixed value. What those probability statements are about are the intervals that I'm calculating. So I'm 95% confident about this interval containing the mean, rather than 95% confident that the mean falls in the interval. Okay? I'm going to make that comment more than once, all right? Because there's a philosophical difference here. Your confidence about the interval, not the mean. The mean is whatever it is. What your confidence is about your interval from your sample. Yeah? No, how confident that you are that your interval contains the mean, right? That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to estimate the mean, right? Okay? Uh, so 5% will be misses. So the width of a confidence interval is going to be based on sample size, because that's going into your standard error, and the standard deviation. So let us take a look. These are the basic procedures. All right? This stuff is all like is sample size level of confidence, random sample, collect the data, you know all of that stuff, right? Calcula calculate the limits of the interval. And this is really the flip side of hypothesis testing. Okay, now I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things here. Our interval limits, right, how wide is it going to be, is approximately two standard errors above and below the mean. Now, why is it two? Well, it's only two if we're using Z. Now, can anybody see why it would be approximately 2 if you're using Z? So that means really big sample size. Where do I get the 2 from? Does anybody see it? No? Yeah. Yeah, you're almost there, right? It's, yeah, it's... Um, Let's say 95% confidence. If it's 95% confidence, what does it mean the area in the tails is going to be? I'm developing an interval that I think is going to contain the mean. If I say I'm 95% confident, that means that this area under the curve is 0.95. So how much is in the tails? in both tails, right? 0 0.025 in each tail. So if I was using Z to figure out what these axis values are, what is it? You know this value. We've used it a lot. 1.96. 1.96. That's why he says approximately 2. So this only applies if you're using Z. It only applies if you're using Z. OK? But still, what we're going to be finding is these values transformed into whatever it is that we're, you know, whatever metric we're talking about. Okay? So let us do this. Let's look at the formula for a minute. Okay? So this formula is if you have a large sample. Again, what's a large sample here? A hundred. A hundred. Now he writes it. As population mean equal to this, I tend to write it like this, just confidence interval, and I usually, you know, 0.95 or 0.99. That's how I write it. You can write it either way, I don't care, but just you should know if I write it this way, that's what I'm doing. So my confidence interval is equal to x bar is my point estimate, plus or minus a critical value times my standard error. So let's actually do it for this example, but I'm going to change one thing. Okay, in this example, so x bar was equal to 10, that hasn't changed. S was equal to 3, that hasn't changed. What am I going to change? N is now going to be 100. N is going to be 100 so that we can use the Z formula. And I want to find the 95% confidence interval. So 
So what is the only thing I'm missing here? Well, there's two, there, yeah, there's only one thing I'm missing here. What am I missing? Well, we have the z-critical value, right? What is it? 1.96. We'll see. That keeps winding up here somewhere, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so what's the thing I'm missing? The standard error, right? The standard error. So let's find the standard error. Right, it was my standard deviation, which was still 3, divided by the square root of? Yeah, 100 now. So my sample mean is 10, plus or minus my 1.96, plus and minus 1.96 times 0.3. It's like, okay, great, what is it? So that is an interval estimate <coughs> for the mean number of hours they study at her school. Okay? Now, how do we say this technically correctly? I am 95% confidence. I am 95% confidence. that 9.41 to 10.59 hours contains the population mean number of hours, contains the population mean number of hours studied at her school. And then you've all written it. It's like, okay, what? Right? All you did was you just estimated the number of hours they study at her school. But you just created an interval estimate rather than a point estimate. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Confidence interval. Confidence interval. Okay. It's an interval estimate of the mean. Okay? All right. Yeah? Do I have my population? Right? I'm trying to estimate the population of her school. So what do I do to estimate the population of her school? I start out with a sample, and then I, but I've made it bigger. What is it giving me here? It's giving me an estimate, but it's also telling me how precise we think that estimate is. Okay. Other questions on this? If I was going to change this to a 99% confidence interval, what's the only thing that would change? Yeah. Okay, so if I change this to a 99% confidence interval, still 10 plus and minus, 2.58. 2.58. Right? Because how much area is in the tails if it's a 99% confidence interval? Yeah, 0 0.005. 0 0.005. Okay, so it's 2.58 times 0.3 equals, what does that equal? 9.23 to 10.77. Yeah, it does. I would tell you. Yeah, no, I would tell you. Because it's, again, it's analogous to using alpha of 0.05 or 0.01. Right? So that, that should be specified. But just I just want to point out, I see your hand. I just want to point out, notice, right, this confidence interval is wider. Right? It's wider than this one. Because all things, everything else was equal, but the more confident I was, the wider my interval was. Okay? Yeah. Sure. 
I'm 95% confident that 9.41 to 10.59 contains the population mean number of hours studied at her university. Is that good? Okay. Okay. So for the 99% confidence interval, that's all we did that was different. Okay. Now, just to reiterate some things, right? If we increase the n, it makes the interval narrower and more precise. Think about it logically. You can see it in the formula, but think about it logically. The larger your sample is, the closer it gets to the population, right? The better your estimate is going to be. So that's why your confidence interval will be narrower. It will be more precise. You know, because your sample is actually getting closer to the population. Okay? Now, this is just comments on what happens if you multiply n by some factor. Don't worry about it too much. And down here also, I just want to talk about this. You're not going to be held responsible for it, but it's just because it doesn't happen all that often. But I just want to make a comment on what it is. Sometimes you want to get an interval estimate that is more precise. I mean, obviously, we usually want a more precise interval estimate. But sometimes you're going for a particular goal and you need precision in your estimate. I don't know whether it's a diet loss program or Kaplan's and you want to specify number of points that people are, you know, whatever it is. But you may only want a confidence interval that's a particular width. So the question is, how do I get an interval that wide? Well, what you can play around with is n. Because n affects the width of the confidence interval. So this formula is a way of figuring out how many subjects you need, how many participants you need based on a particular width of a confidence interval. So in this formula, w is how wide you want your interval to be. And n is the number of subjects you need in order to accomplish that. Okay? This is just a possibility. Like I said, it's an unusual scenario. But if you saw it, I just wanted you to understand. Now this. This formula also, it only works when you have really large sample sizes. Why? He has 4 in there. What is that 4 times the standard error? Again, it goes back to 1.96. So it really is only useful when you have a really large sample size. OK. Now what if you have smaller sample sizes? So what do we do? What's this formula? Well, it's the same thing, except instead of z, what am I using? T. I'm just using a T critical value. So let's actually do that. Go back to this example. So we're going to go back to that example. But in this case, we're going to go back to the original example. And the original example, N was 25. So we're going back to 25. In order to create the confidence interval, what do I need here now? What am I missing that I don't have? Yeah, I need to recalculate my standard error, although actually we did it before. And I need my t critical values. OK, <coughs> let's do the standard error first. And we did it, right? What was it? Yeah. Because we did it for our hypothesis test. So the only thing we're missing here is my critical value. OK. Let's go back to the table for a sec. If I was looking for a t critical value here for a confidence interval, am I going to look under significance for one tailed or two tailed? Two tailed. Confidence intervals, by definition, are two tailed, <coughs> right? Because it's that middle bit. OK, so let's say 0.05, two-tailed. How many degrees of freedom? For this example, 24. Guess what? It's the same value we had for our hypothesis test, right? 2.064. Okay, we did this already. So if you've done one, then the other is easy. If you've done a, a hypothesis test, the confidence interval is very easy, and vice versa.
shift it up. No? I can't, where are you guys missing it? Like, where are you missing it? Oh, um, how about I move the podium? I think that actually might be easier. You're welcome. Yeah, it's easier than trying to shift these. Um, okay, so that's my 95% confidence interval using a smaller sample size. Notice, right, it's, sm it's bigger than using Z. Why is it, why is it wider? N is smaller, so that means my standard error is bigger. What's the other thing that's bigger? What's the other thing that's bigger in T rather than Z? Yeah, my critical value. My critical value is bigger. When you go back to only having sample estimates, then there's always more error associated with it. There's just more error associated with it. Okay. So, so it's wider, right? So the t-critical value is larger because there's more errors uh, associated with it, and the standard error is larger. Okay. Now, just as a comment, as a comment, one sample z-tests are not so common. Confidence intervals are relatively common. Something like Nielsen ratings, uh, opinion polls, election polls, those are pretty common. Because this is, this is the benefit that a confidence interval gives you over a hypothesis test, OK? Confidence interval gives you an interval estimate right, of your population parameter. It gives you an interval estimate. It tells you something about the precision and error surrounding that estimate. And it can do a hypothesis test, which we'll do right now. Those are three things that you get. A hypothesis test just gives you a hypothesis test, right? Significant, non-significant, that's it. Confidence interval will give you that, plus the estimate, plus how good the estimate is. That's a big benefit. And nowadays, there's much more of a push for people to understand and use things like confidence intervals rather than just a hypothesis test because of it. Okay? Now, how do I use this hypothesis? How do I use this confidence interval to determine a hypothesis test? Well, let's go back. Let's go back to this one. Okay. Here is so we're using t. We'll use the t values. Okay, so the t values for my confidence interval were 8.76 to 11.24. Not the t-values, but the uh, values using the t-critical value. That was my confidence interval, right? OK. What was my null hypothesis here? My null hypothesis, right, the hypothesis of no difference, is that the mean at her university is 12. OK. Where does 12 fall here? If I was going to write 12 in, where does it fall? Yeah. Well, it falls here, right? It falls here. It falls outside the confidence interval, making it a likely or an unlikely value for the population mean. Unlikely. Unlikely. So therefore, we reject it as an option. We reject it as an option. So the rule is, if your hypothesized value falls in the interval, then we fail to reject. But if your hypothesized value falls outside the interval, then we can reject it as a possibility. So in this case, what do we have? We reject, right, which is good because that's what we did with our t-test. Those should match up. Those should match up. If you're calculating a 95% confidence interval and doing a hypothesis test based on alpha 0.05, the results should be the same. The results should be the same. If they're not, you either did something wrong, or maybe you're using a different alpha level or a different confidence level.
Okay, understanding that? Need me to repeat that? Yeah. The value of 12 is unlikely to be the population mean. No, you would say that they were actually, what you would say is that they were statistically different, significantly different. You know, you'd still repeat that. Yeah. Yes. We're always, when we talk about rejection, it's, it, it's all, or not rejection, it's always the no. Again, because to get to the alternative, it's indirect. It's indirect. Right? If I, I can't prove something is not 12. Because there's an infinite number of values that could be there. So it's just a way of indirectly getting there. OK, what else? <coughs> OK. We're going to do one more example. And just as a comment, right? the assumptions for the one sample t-test and the confidence interval, so those are the same as the assumptions we've always talked about. But let's do one more example. So here's the example. No, no. Assumptions are things that you're supposed to be meeting if you're doing research. No, you can't even prove them. Some of, them. some of them, like I said, some of them you can actually determine from your sample data, some not. That one you can't, like unless you have other extra information. Okay? So this example, a hospital administrator is interested in estimating the mean number of days people stay at her hospital. Okay? Why would somebody be interested in this? Estimating the mean number of days spent at a hospital? Health insurance, right? Money. How much does it cost? Okay. So she took 30 patient records, and she found the average number of days spent there as 5.3 days with a standard deviation of 0.75 days. Okay. So she wants to create a 99% confidence interval to find the population mean number of days spent at her hospital. Right? We have to use T because our sample size isn't big enough. OK, so let's get our standard error. Right? It's our standard deviation divided by the square root of n. n is here. 30. What are the degrees of freedom for this example? 29. Okay, let's go back here. Which column am I going to be looking at? 0.01, two tailed. Two-tailed. So we go down to 29 degrees of freedom, and we see that our critical value was 2.756. All right, so. Right? So it's going to be 5.3, right? Because it's around there. OK, 
Anyone want to take a stab at how you would say these results? Right? What do you say here? I'm 99% confident that 4.92 to 5.68 days, you could say, contains the population mean number of days spent in the hospital. Number of days spent in the hospital. Okay, again, and I just want to draw your attention to something that she said that was that was perfect because somebody uh, in yesterday's class made a mistake that like people do all the time, that the population mean is in that interval, right, or that that interval contains the population mean. What's the probability that that interval will contain the sample mean? A hundred percent. Because you use the mean, use the sample mean to create the interval. But people mix that up all the time, so don't do that. You're trying to estimate a population mean. Okay. Last question on this. Let's say we found that the, uh, the population mean for the country, number of days spent in the hospital, is 3.5 days. Is her hospital significantly different from the rest of the country? Yeah? Yeah, because that 3.5 falls outside the confidence interval. OK? So we'd reject the null. Yes, you'd reject the null hypothesis here. Right? I just want to draw your attention to something on the table. We don't have an example for it here, but I want you to see it. Look at the bottom, degrees of freedom for 120. If you have degrees, so this is what happens. Sometimes you don't have the exact number of degrees of freedom, right? Like when it goes from 30 to 40, right? So you don't have 35. The rule that you're going to use is that you always go to the next one lower. We're more conservative when we do a hypothesis test. You go to the next one lower. The only exception is, if you have over 120, you can go to infinity. Over 120, you can go to infinity. Because look at something, right? Over 120, here's our value, 1.96. So it's just you're becoming a normal distribution again anyway. So over 120, you can just go to infinity and OK. Yeah. I'm 99% confident that that interval contains the population mean number of days spent in the hospital. Yeah? She would not say that the population mean, I'm 99% confident that the population No, the preference, philosophically, yeah, it's, it's like not. I don't know if you guys heard. I really don't want you to say I'm 99% confident that the mean falls in the interval. I really want you to say I'm 99% confident that the interval contains the mean. That's really what I want. Yeah? And not 99? Because, I mean, why, why to 120? Why not to 115? This is just what they decided to do. I mean, if you see, for 100, right, for 120, it's still 1.98. So it's a little off still. But people generally think over 100, it makes no difference. So I don't know if that answers your question. Sort of? Sort of. OK. All right, folks, I will see you next week.